Mary, talk about that. Do you think that David's right, that you get penalized for conservation? That's one of the hurdles we have to get, we get I, beyond? I absolutely think it's one of the hurdles we have to get past. I think Austin and San Antonio and other places across the country have shown that there's widespread voter support for small increases in sales tax when they know what the purpose of that those funds are going to be and how they're going to be used and it protects their water supply. Um, I think we can provide incentives to conserve to landowners. I think when it comes to cities, um, we might have to be a little tougher. We might have to have better review of the conservation plans that cities do. Right now, it's kind of a check the box sort of deal. I think people need to get active at their cities and you're not gonna get pipes fixed unless you get citizens asking for it and that's gonna cost money. People have to understand that tiered water rates, the more you use, the more you pay per gallon are a good way to conserve kind in cities. Kind of a pay-as-you-go deal. Pay-as-you-go, and it right. can't be this sort of just block we can't raise a water rate ever on anybody. We're gonna have to have those tiered conservation rates. And the other thing I think that we need to think about in this state, which is done in many parts of the West, is compensating, um, it's usually farmers or ranchers who have older water rights that don't really wanna use them anymore, would like to leave them in stream, why don't we pay them for that? And uh, there's a lot of ways I think we could work with river authorities and downstream users right. to compensate those landowners to leave those rights in the a stream. A disincentive for them to sell the rights and therefore put the whole watershed at risk. Right, let's yeah. leave, figure out a way to compensate them for leaving them. Yeah, Andy, what, what, what do you think about this? Well, I, I don't think there's any question about it. I think that one of the most important things that uh, people in our movement, the conservation movement, can figure out a way to do is to use the market skills that organizations like the Nature Conservancy and the Trust for Public Land have used for so many years to protect land to do the, exactly the kind of transactions that Mary's talking about to keep water in the rivers. Can you, can you go into that a little bit more? So what would you propose we do specifically? Well, uh, first of all, there, there's a, there, are, there are instances where people can take tax ed deductions for donations of water. The state makes that difficult right, right now. You could, you could find uh, ways to finance transactions in which water rights were purchased if the state would permit it simply for the purpose of leaving it in the river, right. nourishing the rivers and, and the bays and estuaries. I've heard you talk about oh, the notion of a water easement. That would be a, a that would that would be a possibility, absolutely. It would, and that would and that would help some of the problem. Mary, you're nodding. Yes, you think so? And the other thing we need to do is make our Senate Bill Three process to define environmental flow targets. We need to make that process work. I mean, if you don't want the rivers run under the Endangered Species Act, fine. But let's make that Senate Bill Three process to keep our river, rivers and bays and estuaries healthy. Let's make it work. It is a low cost process. We just need to be committed to it. Joe Nick, the problem though is again, low cost or not. There's not very much money for anything right now, right? I mean, it's, it's, hard, it's well, hard to make arguments for new programs. You offer incentives where you can. It'd be great uh, if we got tax breaks for building rainwater catchment in rural areas like where I live to get off the well. And instead, it's you just have to want to do the right thing. There, there's very little incentive. And David Langford's Texas Wildlife Association did a great landowner uh, cooperative effort to conserve water in the hill country and basically increase the water supply of, of rivers and streams in the hill country. And the reward was more people want it and they're trying to take it from them. That there, there's, we're, we're not given rewards for, or any incentive to conserve and we're not doing enough with our waste. I mean, in, in what is it, or, is it Orange County in California that paid a record price for effluent? They paid more money for sewage water than what, we would pay for raw water here, clean water, just so they can reprocess it. We should be more aggressive in desal and in treating, uh, retreating uh, water and making it clean again, rather than taking it from areas. Because I think the bottom line is, if this state wants to grow, as I hear the talk continue, that how much it's growing, if we don't have quality of life insurances, if we don't have rivers in places like Barton Springs, that draw hundreds of thousands of people as a tourist attraction, much less local people, you're not gonna have, you're gonna have instances like the Boeing Corporation. Texas offered Boeing Corporation far more than Chicago or Denver did to relocate from Seattle. We offered them more money. They ended up going to Chicago citing quality of life issues, meaning environment and conservation and recreational activities. And if we don't supply those, 
I mean, there were already studies how, how underserved we are for recreational activities in this Texas Triangle, our urban area. If we don't do more to improve those opportunities, people aren't going to want to come here. No matter how much money you throw at them. Bookmark that point. I want to, well, okay, go ahead, David, before I go back to Dr. Nick and Andy both uh, touched on it. Water conservation, plentiful groundwater, plentiful surface water is an economic development problem. Who wants to move their company or keep their company in Texas if all the rivers are dry? I mean, it's simple economics. So you don't have to be a tree hugger or a softy about water to make this argument. You can just make it about cold, hard business realities. You want Absolutely. to have a state with good economic development? Right? No question. Yeah. And if we don't believe that can happen in the lifetime of this wonderful series, the Rio Grande stopped flowing to the Gulf of Mexico, which could happen on any one of a number of rivers in our state. I wanted to ask, Doctor. let me go to Dr. McKinney very quickly on the issue of conservation and the impact on the Gulf specifically before we open up the conversation to economic development. I think we can spend a lot of time on that. Dr. McKinney, you alluded to the fact that there's a, a sort of, I refer to it as dominoes falling, that basically, you know, if you kind of go out from the problem of not, of insufficient conservation, ultimately the problem shows up in your neck of the woods, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, in spades, uh, because that, that is, when we talk about estuaries, that, that are, that's the, primary engine for our, our coastal economies. You want. And we saw that in, this, in the uh, oil spill, how closely uh, the economies of, of all those states that were affected to a healthy estuarine system or a healthy, healthy coast. Right. And the key to our healthy coast is water because all of our estuaries you know, depend on that water for, for the main things, for sediment, for nutrients and, and circulation, all those types of things, salinity gradients. And so clearly uh, for us, water uh, is uh, on the coast and for a healthy coast, a resilient coast that could withstand oil spills, for example. I mean, the best defense against an oil spill is a healthy, resilient ecosystem. Right. And, the ha and the definition of that in Texas is water. And, and, and we, had, we actually made out better or less bad <laughs> than a lot of other places. Uh, uh, specifically, we'll come back in a bit and talk about the oil spill in, in detail. but. We weathered that okay, but it, it's it, but the red flags go up. What are we going to do? We we need to be ready. Could our time maybe next? Okay. Let me let me ask about the economic. I mean, you actually perfect segue, Dr. McKinney, into the economic development question. You know, the Parks and Wildlife Department likes to brag on all the paddling trails. We know about the recreational opportunities made available by plentiful water in Texas. It does have an impact. Can you quantify, Carter, from the Parks and Wildlife Department's perspective? just what that impact is? Yeah, and I think we can look at that many ways, but if you look at the fact that the state has a million hunters, two and a half million fishermen, four million outdoor enthusiasts that enjoy the outdoors and contribute you know, upwards of $16 billion to our state's economies, much of that is predicated on having water-based recreation opportunities and, and healthy, clean rivers, a healthy, clean base to fish and paddle and, and, and recreate in. And so um, the value of that resource cannot be understated to communities big and small. Um, but particularly as we think about the tourism equation along the coast, it's absolutely essential that we have the kind of healthy ecosystems that uh, Larry is referring to. And if you're going to have a healthy estuary and bay system, you also have to be very concerned about what's happening upstream and the aquifers that ultimately feed the springs, that feed the rivers, that feed the estuaries. So it speaks to the interconnectedness of it all. And so when you cut money from the budget that's dedicated to this issue, you're ultimately not just cutting those dollars, but you're cutting the dollars that show back up in the multiple that comes back to the state in the form of tourism. So for every dollar spent by, you know, on, on, the, on this, the state might get back three dollars, four dollars, something oh, like at that. Oh, at a minimum. At a minimum. Uh, there's always some multiplier effect of that in terms right. of the value of those dollars to local communities. We could be leaving money on the table. Yeah, the, 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 the kind of recreation we're talking about that's focused around water is very much an economic engine in these communities throughout the, throughout the state. And again, we see it in communities big and small throughout, the, throughout Texas. Uh, take one look on highway. Yes. Sorry, take one look on Highway 71 and see how many of the billboards for the new ranchettes advertise flowing creeks and flowing streams and right. the springs of the hill it country. It ought to say for now. Uh, for now, right. that's you know, it's absolutely critical to property values in that. Truth area. and advertising at the moment, right? Bet. Yeah, at you're exactly moment. right, Dr. McKinney, and then David. Oh, just just to wrap, uh, add to that, it's not just uh, the direct uh, uh, benefits for for recreation, but there's indirect ones. Since I've moved down to Corpus, I've worked with the Chambers of Commerce down there and looking at some different studies. And of course, they're looking at how can they grow, and where, where do you grow? And, and they reinforced a study that was done uh, for Parks and Wildlife some years ago, and we're talking about companies. Where, where's the growth in industry? It's really small businesses, the, the kind of intellectual type businesses, the 10 to 20 
uh, person companies or that, that's where you can get a lot of growth that's very high end uh, and the types of employees that they have. So they're, they're very, uh, very high on the economic benefits. And when you, when you talk to them, uh, when they talk about where can they locate, because they're small, there's lots of them, because they're small, they can go wherever they wish. And what they pick out, as David said, is they look for places, or quality of life and environment. They can go where they want to go. And so that's, if you, if you want to see economic growth in, in the future, that's something that you're going to have to take into account of. Uh, Joe, Nick, I want to, well, David, I want to let you go next, and then I want to ask you a question, Joe. Mary touched on uh, uh, my point, which is it's not just on the income statement part of the financial. It's also on the balance sheet. Water under Depends much of the value of the real estate. I mean, it, 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 look at look at uh, any place in the hill country that the difference, if, even if they're next door to each other, the one that has water and one that doesn't have water. And you look at uh, the big financial disaster that we had. It was a lot of the cause was because everybody was suddenly undercapitalized. Well, you take a place in the country that you have a big mortgage on that suddenly the water has been goes stolen away. away from you, it goes away, you're undercapitalized and you're upside down again in your financial institution. I mean, you pull the, you pull the, the, the uh, critical financial pin out of the stack and all of a sudden it all comes uh, tumbling down and that, that uh, linchpin is water. So it's not unfair to say that the health of the economy, at least in part, depends upon the happy resolution of this sure. issue. Yeah. Joe, Nick, I was intrigued to hear you talk about the, the economic development uh, st stuff from the standpoint of attracting companies. You know, there was this big theory 10 or 15 years ago, Richard Florida, the professor at Carnegie Mellon University, talked about the creative class and how cities like Austin manage to attract a lot of companies because they have a vibrant arts community. Maybe there's a liquid class. Maybe we actually have a, a deal where cities and, 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 and areas that have plentiful water, recreation opportunities, and what have you, are much more apt to attract not only companies, but just people to transplant to Texas. Richard Florida's first piece of writing on the creative class was following a, a, a very bright student from Carnegie Mellon University who did not stay in Pittsburgh. And he was talking about all the subsidies for stadium development and for athletic teams. The kid wanted to come to Austin because he was different. He had tattoos, but he's also smart as all get out. And one of the linchpins of Austin I, I contend, as always, it's Barton Springs and it's the Hill Country. People, it's the one city in Texas, the one urban area, where that creative class is continuing to funnel in, where cities like Dallas and Houston are trying hard to capture some of that. But it's the advantage, and it's, it's, they come for not just the job, but what's there beyond the job. And I will, I'll cite my son, who just left a nice job in Washington, D.C. to come to Austin because this is where it's at. And it's got the, these, this quality of life. You can't get in Washington, D.C. at twice the salary. I and I think we need to be taking a look at what makes us, what makes us look, look good to the rest of the country. Why do people want to come here? Why do people want to come to South by Southwest? I mean, why is that in, in Austin, Texas? It's not a convention. Why is the biggest music convention in the United States, in the world, in Austin, Texas. It's got a lot to do with what is around us. It's not all bricks and mortar. And uh, water uh, is at the, at the key to all that. Uh, Mary and then Andy. Uh, 